were discussing about uh, the chemical shifts uh, and this is just a quick recap on what we did last time. So, we have a nucleus which is here and you have an electron cloud around it which is indicated by the green dots here and we have an applied magnetic field which is B0 indicated here as B0. In the previous um, uh, class I might have said it as H0, but it does not matter it is B0 here and uh, this B0 field induces a current in this electronic cloud and which produces a magnetic field which opposes the externally applied magnetic field and therefore the field seen by the nucleus is Bi and that is given by B0 into 1 minus sigma i. So, that is uh, the sigma i is the so called screening constant and this can vary depending upon the environment uh, of your molecule. And the precessional frequency of a particular nucleus will then be nu omega i or this is if you put it in terms of uh, frequency in hertz that is minus gamma b i divided by 2 pi and b i is the field which is which is given here. Now, to this will then de depend upon the magnetic field strength. Therefore, we, since we want to characterize only the uh, screening or the electronic environment around a nucleus, we define a, an entity which is given here delta i is equal to nu i minus nu r uh, divided by nu naught. Nu r is a kind of a reference compound and you measure the absorption frequencies with respect to a particular line of a reference compound and then this will be a very small number compared to nu naught. Nu naught is your spectrometer frequency this corresponds to B naught. So, you divide it by this nu naught then of course, this will be a number which will be very small and you multiply therefore, by 10 to the power 6 although that is not I wrote it in the previous one and that is called as the ppm delta i is expressed in terms of ppm. Higher delta i means higher B i implicating downfield shift and therefore, it is less screening and uh, you will have a spectrum which is at a lower uh, higher frequency of absorption. And higher uh, sigma i um, the, uh, lower delta implies that greater shielding that will mean in an upfield shift and vice versa. So, this is of course, we already did this last time and uh, let me uh, uh, explain that a little bit more here. We take this example, this is vinyl chloride. So, vinyl chloride has uh, 3 protons, this has 3 protons here, this is uh, let us label them as H, A, H, B and H, C, there is a double bond here and chlorine is an electron withdrawing group. Therefore, it changes the electron density in these proton uh, around the protons. So, we said whatever is the electron density that determines how much will be the screening. So, therefore, if the electron density is lower then the screening will be less and therefore, that will be at a higher uh, frequency of absorption or the lower delta value uh, I mean the higher delta value. So, the frequency absorption is going like this. So, the chemical shift here the H B which is the closest to the chloride which is the, uh, with the electron withdrawing group. Therefore, this will have the lowest electron density here. Therefore, the energy separation the B i will be highest for this particular nucleus and this nu b therefore, will be the highest because the energy of absorption will be high, the energy separation will be higher. This will be followed by nu a which is uh, indicated here, this is a trans and therefore, the effect of the chloride will be after this it will be more at this point which is trans to the chloride group and this will have the next frequency which is nu a and the one which is the cis to it that you look at the van der Waals interactions and things like that the screening will be more here therefore, the lowest delta will be for the nu c. Therefore, the frequency increases in this order and the chemical shifts numbers delta values will increase in this order. Okay. So, this is how the chemical shift occurs because of the screening by the electron cloud around it. And clearly this is an important parameter which will describe the electronic environment and therefore, the structures of the molecules. And there and a chemist used a larger number of uh, molecules to characterize this uh, chemical shifts in the functions and what are the reference compounds. I said there is with respect to a reference compound we define the um, chemical shift. So, for the proton there are several reference compounds which are used. TMS is tetramethylsilane, 
and this is it has one line so that is taken as chemical shift that line is taken as 0, 0.0 ppm. And TMS is the one which is used whenever your solvent is chloroform or DMSO and things like that and um, it is single line and which is the most upfield because the screening is the highest for that there are 3 methyl groups and therefore uh, silane uh, SiCH3. So therefore this is uh, the 0 ppm CH34 okay. Now tetramethyl silyl propionate uh, this is the molecule which is used for um, soluble uh, systems the, if you are working in water then typically you use this tetramethyl silane propionate and that is that also is one line and this other things are deuterated and you will have one line and that is uh, you have uh, 0, 0.0. Another common compound which is used is DSS sodium 44 dimethyl 4 silapentane sulfonate this has many lines but if you deuterate all the other protons excepting one then you will have only one line. Otherwise you have the most upfield line which is taken as 0, 0.0. Other compounds are also used, acetonitrile is used sometimes, dioxane is used, tertiary is used and various different kinds of compounds are used for referencing. And what numbers which are given here are with respect to the TSP or the TMS and you have this one uh, as the reference uh, chemical shift and others will be a reference according to that. For carbon 13 similarly you use TMS, TSP or DSS and these are all at 0 frequency. For nitrogen 15 you use ammonium chloride or liquid ammonia and both are these their chemical shifts are taken as 0, 0.0 and for phosphorus you use 85 percent phosphoric acid and that also the line is taken as 0, 0.0. So all your you either you add these um, things internally inside the sample itself or you put this in a capillary and insert that in your uh, sample tube. Then it is called as an external uh, reference. If you put that inside the molecule itself, then it is called as uh, internal reference. Okay. So I can, I can write that here. So you can have an external reference. In that case, the uh, capillary containing the reference compound is introduced in the sample tube. If you directly put this molecule inside your sample then it is an internal reference. Sometimes you use uh, if you are working with water you look at the water signal itself, you look at the water signal itself and make as make that as a reference compound. Often you do not like to put additional molecules inside your sample especially you are working with biological systems with uh, proteins or nucleic acids or any other biological system you do not want to introduce an external uh, molecule external perturbation because it can change your conditions it may change the pH or things like that. So when you do not want to do that then what you do is reference your water molecule water signal with respect to that and use the water signal it itself as a reference compound that is that uh, often is done. Now so having worked with a large number of uh, organic molecules the chemists have come out with certain kinds of uh, understanding as to what sort of a groups will have what kind of ppm in their values and this actually uh, figure shows that sort of an information here. So 0 ppm is what we said earlier this is the TMS or TSP or whatever and if you have saturated compounds and those signals will appear between 1 and 2 ppm. You have the allylic ones they appear here in this region and you have the CH2X which are the electron withdrawing groups here CH2O, CH21 or this ROH alcohol. Now what we are talking about is the signals from R not the OH okay. and those ones will appear in this area. Then you have the vinylic compounds and the which I, I showed you the vinylic, vinyl chloride earlier and those ones will appear in this region 5 to 6 ppm and if you have the aromatic compounds, the aromatic compounds will appear between 6 to 8 ppm or 8.5 ppm all these benzene rings various kinds of uh, rings which are there the protons in those ones will appear in this area and if you have the aldehyde group the RCHO 
then we are talking about this particular proton here. This proton will appear at uh, this place here and RCOOH this is the carboxylic acid group this proton will appear here. And here of course the OH also will appear in this area it can vary from here this is a wide range here depending upon what the R is you will have a wide range of things and depending upon what the conditions are what is the pH of the solution you can have this OH proton appearing in a wide range of frequencies. So therefore it is very sensitive to the conditions of your sample and that proton chemical shifts can vary quite a lot depending upon the environment in your solution. Similar exercise now let me explain to you I explained last time about the aromatic ring effects. The aromatic ring effects what is shown here is if I have uh, a ring I showed here a ring and it has the electron cloud above and below and it produces a external uh, induced magnetic field because of the currents inside this the field goes like this and like this and you can have a proton anyway present. So depending upon the proton you will have different kinds of uh, chemical shifts. What are shown here are the iso shielding lines. So let us say I have a ring here and then I draw a cylinder around this. If I draw a cylinder the electronic current is here okay. Now let us say I consider a position I mean this I define the coordinate system here and this coordinate system here this is called the z coordinate and this is called as the these are the cylindrical coordinates. So rho and z are the cylindrical coordinates. So depending upon where your proton is suppose I say I have a proton here okay. So it will have a certain coordinate z coordinate and the rho coordinate. So this is the coordinate of these are the cylindrical coordinates for this particular proton. What will be the chemical shift there? So what is what has been done is the previous slide which I showed here. So what is plotted is the z versus rho one particular one particular quarter of this. So this this entire circle instead of the entire circle you particularly take one quarter of this. So you have the cylinder lying on top here like this. So I take this particular quarter here. So if I plot this how the z axis is on this going up the z axis on this axis on the right orthogonal is the rho axis and what are the chemical shifts in those ones. So now you see here as you go up uh, as you go up along the z axis so that is if you are on the top here if you are there then you have positive shifts here plus 4.00, 3.0, 2.0, 1.0. In all these positions at all these positions it will have the same 1.00. If you are here along this contour then you will have 0.00. If you are here 4.00 if you are here then it is 4.0. So this is all positive numbers here. And this is the 0 axis this is the no change here. And if you are on this side as the row is increasing here you start getting negative numbers which means you are on the horizontal plane of the plane of the ring. If you are on the plane of the ring then you get negative shifts and that is to be expected because the field is opposing the field is opposing in the, in the horizontal plane. In the vertical axis the field is adding to the your main H0 field and therefore there it causes a positive shift the iso shielding curves and this is on the negative side. So this is the calculation which has been done by theoretical uh, procedures using the theory of chemical shifts in great detail and therefore this is extremely valuable to predict depending upon where you are with respect to the ring with respect to the ring where you are you will have different kinds of chemical shifts. This is important to know how far it can go and these are in certain units of 1.39 uh, angstroms you see each one of these the z and the rho are given in units of 1.39 angstroms. For the some particular reason they have used this number one point is the chemical length of a carbon carbon bond. So uh, uh, particular uh, bond which they have chosen and they have given this in the, this is taken from this reference the journal of chemical phase you see 1958 quite old and of course these things are valid all along. So, 
So, this is an important uh, effect which is the ring current effect. This is also called the anisotropy because of the ring there is an anisotropic uh, in the chemical shifts depending upon the orientation of the ring depending upon the location of your proton with respect to the ring you will have different chemical shifts and that is drawn in the form of a contour ok. So, because there are two coordinates which are responsible one is the on the um, rho and one is z depending upon the combination of these you will have different kinds of shifts. Okay. So, this is what I uh, explained to you. Now, uh, similarly for the pro that is for the proton, similarly you can also have the carbon chemical shifts. Now, the carbon chemical shifts also you see this carbon has a much wider range of chemical shifts. While proton went from 0 to 10 or 12 ppm, carbon goes from 0 to 200 and 230 ppm. This is a quite a wide range of chemical shifts you have here. And uh, once again depending upon the nature of the carbon you have different kinds of chemical shifts. The highlighted carbon is indicated in red color here. So, you have RCOC that appears in this area, C double bond CC that appears here in this range and this range and C aromatic you have this one here, CSR, NR2, CH saturated alkanes, CBR and CI. So, CCR, so all of these, these are the um, uh, halides here iodine, chlorine, fluorine and those ones will appear in this area R2 C CH2 is if you look at this CA carbon it will appear here and if you have the aromatics the aromatic carbons will appear from 100 to 150 ppm heteroaromatics means if you have this uh, heteroatoms substituents over there they will appear here and RC triple bond N that will appear here sulfoxide, sulfones. See this is the result of enormous amount of data collection. There is a huge database, such thing databases are available in the literature and there are also many, many volumes of database of the chemical shifts um, reported and from this you draw this sort of a picture. So, amides appear here RCO NR2, RCO2 R dash. So, these are the acids esters here and these are the carboxylic acids and they appear in this region 150 to 200 ppm typically the carbonyl carbons. So, you see the typically the carbonyl carbons appear in this area, aromatic carbons appear in this area, aliphatic carbons appear in this area and mostly we will be dealing with these kind of chemical shifts when we do with proteins or nucleic acids. Because there you have the aliphatic uh, carbons they will all appear in this area and the aromatic carbons the carbonyl groups in peptide bonds and things like that they will all appear in this area aromatic carbons in this area and so on and so forth, phenylalanines and all of these aromatic ring, uh, rings in amino acids they will appear in this area. So, this sort of a classification is extremely useful for understanding the structures of molecule. First of all you have to assign the individual resonances to particular nuclei both proton and carbon and once you have done that then you can go forward to see what sort of a structural uh, indicators they are. And now there is another important parameter which is called as the spin spin coupling. Now, the protons while they are uh, surrounded by the electrons and that is of course uh, important to screen the magnetic field, but the protons themselves they also interact with each other. Suppose I take this CHCl2 and CHO, this proton and this proton they are separated by 3 bonds ok. So, let me write here C let us say. CH ok this is this molecule right. So, now you have this proton and this proton and here you have Cl, Cl these two protons interact with each other because they are all magnetic they are magnetic moments they are magnetic dipoles therefore, they interact with each other either through directly directly through space interaction. So, there are two kinds of interactions possible dipolar interactions ok dipolar interaction or there is other what is called as through the electrons through the electrons in the intervening bonds. 
Now, dipolar interaction is a separate story, this is actually most applicable in the case of solid state NMR and relaxation phenomena and uh, we will also talk about it a little bit later. And uh, uh, mostly for what we see in uh, um, uh, organic molecules or so molecules, these are the interaction through the electrons and this is also called as uh, J coupling, spin spin coupling is also called this coupling is called as J coupling. Okay. What is the result of this? I am just showing you the spectrum here. You have the delta B, this is the chemical shift, you have the chemical shift of the particular nucleus, let us say we call this one of them as A, other one as B. So let me say this is A and this is B and you have the chemical shift of B here and the chemical shift of A here. But this line is now not appearing at delta B, it is actually getting split into two lines. This is split into two lines too and the separation between them is the so called spin spin coupling constant and that is JAB. Why does this happen? How does this happen? So we can represent this as uh, uh, in this manner. Uh, let us say I have a uh, proton here, I write a proton here and this is my H, C, C, H. So this is the orientation of the spin here. If I call this as let us say the alpha state is the alpha oriented parallel to the field. So there are also electrons here. So there are also electrons here, right? In the bonds there are electrons. So these electrons, what happens is the proton nuclear magnetic moment polarizes the electron spin, electron magnetic moment and makes it orient in a direction opposite to the alpha state of the proton nuclear orientation. Now since these two are in the same bond, so this electron which has two, this bond has two electrons, the second one will be oriented in this manner because they have to be anti-parallel that contributes to the lowest energy state and therefore it will be anti-parallel. Once this one is there, then suppose this were carbon 13, suppose this is carbon, this is also has a nucleus and now it will orient this nuclear, uh, I should use a different color here again. So this is the nuclear, magnetic nuclear spin, it orients it like this and this in turn orients the electron here, it will put in this direction and the pairing electron it puts in this direction and now once again let us let us put the, the carbon will again be uh, up. So the carbon here will be up if it has to be open. Now then I put the proton once more I mean the electron I put it here like this and then like this and what will happen to this? So therefore this will become like that. So these two protons are anti-parallel to each other. Okay. So therefore they are oriented in opposite direction. Now in terms of the interaction between these two, how do we describe this? We describe this interaction as J I A dot I B. Now if they are opposite to each other, if they are opposite to each other, this interaction will be, it will produce a negative number, right? I A dot I B is I A I B cosine. 180 I Z A I Z B cosine pi. So if they are exactly one day opposite to each other this will be negative. Therefore if they are opposite to each other they will have a different energy level. Okay? So because of this now if J is positive this interact this state will be the lower in energy compared to the other state where this can be positive also. It is not that the other thing is not possible. It is also possible that this fellow will become uh, negative down here, this goes up, the other configuration is also possible. The other configuration will be you have this here, the other one is let us say it is also like this is another configuration. Okay, this is configuration 1, this is the configuration 2, this is also possible. This will have a different energy compared to this and this energy will be lower compared to this. Okay. So in other words, the proton alpha state will be split into two levels. So now I draw here the alpha state of the proton, this will have two 
energy levels because it will split into two because of the orientation of the other spin. Now this is let us say I call it as uh, nu A and this is alpha state of nu A and here the uh, yeah, I will write here the spin state of the X nucleus. Let me write the X nucleus and if this is beta this will be down the energy because these are opposite orientations and this is alpha here this is the orientation of the other spin this is the beta spin the B spin orientation. So therefore these two have different energies obviously instead of one line coming here there will be two lines coming there. If I call this as the beta state so here again it is split into two okay it is split into two why and the beta with the alpha goes down. So this one this is the alpha and this is the beta because I1 dot I2 if the two are in the same direction if the two are in the same direction it will be positive energy if they are in the opposite direction then it will be negative energy. So therefore the beta alpha goes down beta beta goes up alpha alpha goes up alpha beta goes down. So therefore they we will have this orientations like this and what is this energy separation here? This will be of the order of few hertz and that is J it is the J which is indicated similarly here. Now what are the transitions possible here? Well, the transitions will be dependent on delta M is equal to plus minus 1. So what instead of this transition I will have two transitions now which are the two transitions possible? I can have a transition M is equal to from M is equal to 0 to 1. So what is the what is the M value for the beta beta the M value here let me write the M value this is minus 1 the beta well, M value is 0 here because of the beta alpha one is down other one is up the sum of the two M values is equal to 0 here. Similarly this one is 1 and this one is 0 the total M value okay the summation of the M values I am writing here of the individual spins this is the, now I should have a transition where delta M is equal to plus minus 1 okay this is summation M i of the 2 okay. Now which transitions are possible I will have a I will have a transition possible from here to here 1 to 0 and 0 to minus 1 I will have another transition possible here there are two transitions possible okay. So therefore this leads to a separation okay how much is this separation here this is j by you can you can calculate what is the value of that this will be j by 4 this will be j by 4 the separation will be j by 4 this will also be j by and then the energy which is going down will be j by 4 okay that is j by 2 total. So now if you look at this therefore you will have two lines for each one of those so we will have two green two sign lines. So one is between these two states this is from here to here which I indicated and the other one is from here to here 0 to minus 1 up and down both are possible. Okay, therefore delta m is equal to plus minus 1 we will have these two states and the separation between them will be j. Okay, this is how the splitting occurs between the two energy levels. So we can do the same thing for the other spin as well and that is beta spin I wrote it for the new a notice this is in megahertz okay, this new a is in megahertz and this is in hertz therefore this is a very small number this is a very small number. So similarly one can write for the nu b as well. So I can write for nu b as well so I will also have two lines corresponding here and the separation between them will be this is nu b and this separation will be j a b. I showed you for the three bonds you can have coupling from one bond you can have one bond coupling that is let us say proton to C13 or you can have proton to nitrogen 15 you can have two bond couplings this is one you can also have two bond couplings that is like CH CH here so that is a coupling between these two this is a two bond coupling I showed you the three bond couplings that is H C C H these are three bond couplings the same mechanism applies in all of those cases and notice here this how far does it go how far this relay goes it does not go beyond four bonds 
okay. Because if you go beyond 4 bonds then the effect will be relatively small then you do not see the coupling as much. So typically so you will see from 1 to 4 bonds coupling. And they have different ranges. So if I want to write the these are typically of the order of uh, 1 bond couplings of the order of carbon couplings are of the order of 140 to 200 hertz that is a uh, and then you have 90 to 100 hertz for the proton this one and this is for this one and the 2 bond couplings are of the order of 14 to 18 hertz and 3 bond couplings will also be of the order of 3 to 15 hertz. Okay. And incidentally one more thing one has to notice is the 2 bond couplings can have a negative J value. Now go back to this uh, previous slide here. Now I showed you the value of J interaction is J I1 dot I2 right. So if J is positive I1 dot I2 if it is negative then there is a decrease in energy. If J is negative then it will be I1 dot I2 negative will be positive right so the total will become positive. In the case of 2 just if you take 2 bond, two bond let us say H C H and I draw the spins here like this and let us say this one is like this, this one is like this electron spin and I have here this one let us say like this, this one like this and this is the most stable state. Let us assume this is the most stable state. Now you see the 2 proton spins are parallel to each other. And this is if it is a stable state this actually has to be energy has to be negative. So this parallel state has lower energy so this implies that J is less than 0 because it decreases the energy value and therefore the geminal couplings the so called geminal couplings are negative whereas the vicinal couplings and the one bond couplings they are all positive. Okay, so I think I think I will uh, stop here. I can we go to the next one in the next class.